I'm Dr. Amy Waldman, and I'm delighted to speak to you today about Palaisius Merzbacher and Palaisius Merzbacher like disease. Here are my disclosures. I will present an overview of Palaisius Merzbacher and Palaisius Merzbacher like disease, review the hypomyelinating imaging features of this disorder, and discuss the preclinical data for future therapies for Palaisius Merzbacher disease. Palaisius Merzbacher disease is caused by mutations of the proteolipid protein 1 gene located on the long arm of the X chromosome. It causes extensive loss of myelinating oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. There are multiple genetic mutations of PLP1, including point mutations causing abnormal PLP protein, duplications that result in overexpression of the otherwise normal protein, and no mutations, which result in no protein expression. There are a range of clinical phenotypes, including the severe conatal PMD presenting early in infancy, and a relatively mild X-linked spastic paraplegia on the opposite end of the spectrum presenting a little bit later in life. Here is a pictorial representation of the spectrum of clinical symptoms along the top, the genetic mutations, and the mechanisms of disease. Important to note here is that point mutations often result in early disease. Duplications are the most common. Uh, genetic change of PLP1 resulting mostly in classic symptoms and no mutations causing spastic paraplegia. And you will see the mechanisms listed here. This is important for designing future therapies, thinking about these different gain of function, gene dosage, dosage and loss of function mechanisms. I would like to present a case. This young man presented with bilateral nystagmus shortly after birth. He had reflux and some drooling of formula outside of his mouth. He had early developmental delay, starting with difficulty with even head control. His pediatrician sent a microarray because of the developmental concerns and noted a duplication of PLP1 which is originally reported as a variant of uncertain significance. He was then sent for follow-up, ordered, neurology ordered an MRI, and that MRI was reported as normal. I just wanted to take a moment to review MRI characteristics. I know they were covered very well this morning by Dr. Vasseau. Myelinated white matter has a low signal on T2 weighted images and a high signal on T1 weighted images. And this paper, uh, a landmark paper in neurology by Dr. Schiffman and Vanderknapp in 2009 reviews the characteristics of myelin across the age span, but also reviews demyelinating disorders as well as hypomyelinating disorders. As you will see in these T2 images, in demyelinating disorders, you have prominent T2 hyperintensity, so these bright signals, and prominent T1 hypointensity or dark signals of the affected white matter. Whereas in hypomyelinating disorders, the T2 hyperintensity is milder, and it is in combination with T1 hyperintensity, T1 isointensity is shown here, or T mild T1 hypointensity. Here are some examples from that manuscript with the normal T1 and T2 images on the left, some examples of T2 images from the paper showing the prominent T2 hyperintensity, and here hypomyelinating disorders showing the range of T1 abnormalities, including T1 hypointensity, where the gray and white matter look very similar, and mild T1 hypointensity or hyperintensity in some of these additional images. In fact, for our case, there was not normal white matter as reported. This child had mild T2 hyperintensity, and on the right, mild T1 hypointensity um, and perhaps some isointensity of some of the white matter. Just to conclude the discussion on MRI, there's variability in the white matter in Palaisius Merzbacher. For conatal patients, no myelin is present for most of these individuals. In some of the classic forms, the white matter abnormalities are uh, diffuse throughout the hemispheres and involve the corticospinal tracts for many, um, but in some of the milder forms, you have more patchy hyperintensities or um, less diffuse changes throughout the brain.
I will review the spectrum of PMD and the clinical features. I should note that even though we think of these as different phenotypes, really it is a spectrum and there's considerable overlap between the different forms. I will note that the conatal or most severe form does present at birth or within the first few weeks of life. The typical features are, include pendular nystagmus, hypotonia, and bulbar dysfunction, including bulbar weakness, stridor, and even respiratory distress. Gross motor symptoms occur early, including significant head lag as seen in our patient. These individuals don't learn to sit unsupported and cannot ambulate. They have sp significant spasticity. They have some language, mostly receptive, perhaps some expressive language, and they also have optic atrophy and at times seizures. The classic, perform the classic form typically presents a bit later in infancy with hypotonia, also gross motor features such as weakness, trunk and limb ataxia, and head titubation. They also have delayed milestones and most never walk independently. Uh, they have a spastic quadriparesis, and language function can be normal, although dysarthria and cognitive impairments are common. Some argue that there's a transitional form overlapping these two, conatal and classic, I think really just highlighting that this is more of a spectrum than distinct phenotypes. As I mentioned, the X-linked spastic paraplegia is milder. They have delayed gross motor skills, but many do learn to walk. They have mild to severe spasticity. That severe spasticity can affect ambulation. They also have uh, upper motor neuron bladder symptoms, and it can be complicated versus uncomplicated. Complicated spastic paraplegia is similar to the other phenotypes of PMD in which patients have limb and trunk ataxia, as well as nystagmus and mild cognitive impairment, whereas the uncomplicated type really doesn't have any other central nervous system involvement other than the spastic paraparesis and urinary bladder. But again, that just highlights that there's overlap with the spectrums I, I presented on the previous slide. There's also the PLP1 null syndrome, presenting as mild spastic quadriparesis, mostly affecting though the lower extremities. These individuals are able to ambulate. The boys are ataxic but, not, but don't have nystagmus. They often develop language skills, but have some mild cognitive difficulties and even a, a peripheral neuropathy. I will mention that carrier females are often symptomatic. They have a spastic gait, a mild peripheral neuropathy, again, urinary dysfunction. Rarely, but can happen, they have some cognitive impairment or psychosis. And there's a paradoxical relationship between the disease severity in men and affected women due to random inactivation of the X chromosome. Apoptosis of the oligodendrocytes and whether these normal oligos can produce sufficient myelin. So some of the um, more severe boys have more mild, mildly affected moms, and the converse is also true. More affected moms might have mildly affected boys. Here you'll see some of the outcomes following patients longitudinally over time, looking at their gross motor function. On the left, you'll see the gross motor functional classification tool for PMD, ranging the gross motor abilities from zero, which is normal performance for age, to six, which is a loss of any uh, ambulation or locomotion, as well as loss of any head and neck control. What you'll notice is there, there's a lot of stability. There are not necessarily gains or losses in PMD, but relatively stable. Of course, there are some exceptions as shown here, where a child lost um, some uh, motor control with age. And on the right, you will see the time from onset of clinical symptoms to the gross motor functional classification score of four, which again is loss of ambulation. And you'll see that the duplications tend to lose, ambulations, lose ambulation, ambulation earlier than some of the later mutations. I represent this slide from earlier in my talk for two reasons. One, I wanted to remind you that duplications of the PLP1 gene are the most common defect in this disorder. Therefore, the recommended initial genetic screening test, if you are concerned specifically for Palaeus Merzbacher, is actually a microarray which covers the PLP1 locus. Deletions actually account for less than 2% of PMD cases. The second reason I represent this slide is because I'm going to show you data next on some therapeutic strategies that might be helpful in this disorder.
first I wanted to share this study that was recently published in JCI Insight using an adeno-associated virus in vivo gene therapy. The AAV vector was stereotactically injected into the right corpus striatum and internal capsule of wild-type mouse brains at postnatal day 10. And as a result, the mice had increased mature oligodendrocyte number, decreased seed generation, and increased expression of myelin proteins such as MBP, MOG, and CNPase, as well as recovery of myelin density and myelin sheaf thickness. There was also improved astrogliosis and reduced microglial activation, so a more favorable immune profile. And as for the outcome measures, they actually uh, subjected these mice to the open field test, the limb hang test, and the limb slip test. The open field test actually showed no difference among the three groups. The limb hang test examined whole, examined whole body force and muscle coordination, and the treated mice were able to remain hanging on the bar significantly longer than untreated. However, the statistical significance uh, did not hold up and, um, when looking, looking at a one-way ANOVA. The limb, limb slip test monitors coordination of motor function, and the treated mice had fourfold fewer slips than the untreated mice. So some uh, behavioral improvements in these mice. I would also like to share some of Paul uh, Taser's recent publication from Nature. Um, there were two animal models, including a CRISPR knockout of PLP1. The Jimpy mice showed sustained restoration of oligodendrocytes, myelin, axonal conduction velocity, locomotor activity, motor coordination, and a full lifespan. This is not approved for human neurologic conditions as the machinery for oligodendrocytes is not quite uh, feasible. On the other hand, antisense oligonucleotides are in human trials for other disorders. And showing some promising work, the ASO-treated Jimpy mice did show sustained increase in oligodendrocytes, restoration of motor function, and increased survival. And though that animal work is ongoing. I will just take a moment to mention Palaisius Merzbacher like disease. So there are similar clinical features, hence the name, of early onset nystagmus, gross motor delay, spasticity, ataxia, partial seizures, and a mild peripheral neuropathy. However, uh, PMLD, Palaisius Merzbacher like disorder, is not associated with mutations or duplications of PLP1. This disorder appears to be genetically heterogeneous. Therefore, sequencing of only the PLP1 gene may result in delayed or misdiagnosis. So important to think about other mutations such as JC, um, excuse me, GJC2. Um, and there's actually others on the differential diagnosis of hypomyelinating disorders uh, that may have some overlapping clinical features. In conclusion, Palaisius Mertzbacher is characterized by nystagmus, motor delays, spasticity, visual impairment, seizures, and bladder dysfunction. It is a hypomyelinating disorder, so please think about looking at the T1 and T2 images. There are various disease mechanisms lending themselves to different therapeutic strategies, and ongoing natural history studies at CHOP and many other institutions will inform these future clinical trials. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, beautiful job. Um, I'm excited about the therapeutics that are in the near pipeline for PMD. What do you think are the next steps we need to do to get this disease ready for clinical trials? Well, that is a great question. I think there's a few things that I would mention First, um, as many people know, I'm very interested in clinical phenotyping, not because I think that it helps in um, the diagnosis of the disorder. In fact, there's overlapping phenotypes, um, and, and so I think it gets a little confusing when it comes to diagnosing Palaisius Merzbacher, but we really need to understand some of the differences in why a ch one child might have more skills and one child might have less skills, and it, it might be related to age of presentation, but we need to learn a little bit more 
So not only um, is clinical history important and gaining information on presentation and MRI through natural history studies, but I do think that we will likely need some biomarkers, um, whether that is through the spinal fluid or through blood, um, and we need to start trying to understand a little bit more about um, the outcomes in these disorders. So natural history studies are key.